introductions. My name is Dustin Mounts. I'm a technology architect within Accenture, within our technology practice, uh, particularly focusing on custom solutions and, uh, and uh, basically making my, uh, my uh, time spent uh, recently is around making uh, basically life's easier for developers, right? Developing quickly tools, technologies, methodologies. And uh, another hat that I wear is um, the uh, APBG, that is Accenture Pivotal Business Group, which is just a fancy way of saying uh, Accenture Pivotal Partnership. I'm the lead of that within Accenture as well. So I have my counterparts who are also in the audience out here with Pivotal that we work closely with. Uh, to be able to uh, build our capabilities, Accenture's capabilities, around the Pivotal tool set and Pivotal methodologies. And I know who, I was the only person listed as a speaker on this, but I did want to bring up my colleague to help me because he's smarter than me. So if you throw <laughs> any questions my way, it might go to Ryan. But Ryan, if you could introduce yourself. Hey, Ryan Johnson with Accenture. Um, I'm a lead architect out of our Columbus Innovation Hub, uh, as well as with uh, Dustin here, I'm a global capability and enablement lead. All right. So what we wanted to talk about was, uh, now I'll read the title here, Getting Microservices and Legacy to Play Nicely Together with Event-Driven Architectures. Now another name that we have for that within Accenture is called Digital Decoupling. But if we put that on the title, you would have Googled it and probably not figured out what that was. So we wanted to use the opt-in for the longer description that was a little more, a little more script so you knew what we were going to talk about here. But I will refer to Digital Decoupling and, and I can explain what that is. Um, the technologies and the approaches there is nothing really new, but bringing kind of these pieces together that we'll talk about, I would say is a new approach to be able to uh, build modern applications and get your uh, new microservices working with your legacy systems. But first, let's start off with a question. So why does modernization cost so much? Now there's, there's a lot of reasons I think that we can come up with why, but I think the biggest one, and it's kind of a generic thing to say, is uh, technology debt. And that can be a lot of things. It can be the things that we've added to our system that we said, we'll come back later and fix, but we never quite do, right? Or as the system, as the system ages over years, we kind of put things on a sidecar or pin to, right, these different new capabilities in a kind of haphazard way, right? But it offers that business value at that point in time, but it is technology debt, again, that we do not fix. Or maybe we just don't have our documentation up to date, and then after so many years, eventually the people who actually understood the system, they're no longer, no longer with us, right? So there's all different characteristics of technology debt. And we know that not just because we say it. Yeah, so a study Accenture did uh, in 2018 here, uh, talking about technology debt, talking about why technology debt uh, holds back innovation. Uh, increases cost and, and limits our ability to sort of deliver on business value. So uh, the important things to focus on here are the, uh, the two lighter purples there. So those are uh, strongly agree and agree. Um, and as you can see, right, over 75% of, of the respondents here are, are very concerned about technology that feel like it limits their innovation and, and drives increased cost. All right, so when we talk about modernization, right, that's, that's kind of the the key theme for most, most organizations, how do we modernize our legacy system? So before getting into digital decoupling, that getting microservices playing nicely with our legacy, let's talk about some of the other conventions, some of the other techniques around modernization. And we'll throw some of these out there. Maybe, maybe some of you all have done some of these. Um, so the first that you could probably do is, you could call it quick and dirty, right, is around using code generation tools, something like Blue Age. Has anybody, has anybody ever used any of these tools? I actually haven't. I've, I've built custom solutions, right, replaced systems, but no one has used these tools? All right, well, they're out there, and it usually works for, you kind of think of it in the COBOL and the mainframe stages. I have these legacy systems on the mainframe, written in COBOL, and I can use these tools. But these tools have evolved. It's not just for COBOL. You can, you can modernize or use these tools to be able to generate from .NET to Java if you want to. But the problem with these tools is even though it's quick, quick and dirty, kind of gets off that legacy system that you might, might need to get off of, is that if you have a, a mess in COBOL, when you use these tools, you'll have a mess, in this case, in Java, right? And sometimes that's referred to as Joeball, if you've ever heard of that. Don't know who coined that, right? <laughs> it definitely wasn't me. But, but basically, one mess equals another mess when you use these tools. Now, they've gotten a lot smarter. To, to be fair, these tools, they've grown over the years where they've included things like AI even or pattern matching so that if they see certain functions or utilities in the code that are here and scattered throughout, it can recognize that and say, hey, maybe we should actually build that as one component in Java, right, that will be called many, right, and you can change once. 
and so forth. So they, they become more intelligent. But still, at the end of the day, it's your same old system, maybe on a different, a new technology stack. That's great, so they can leverage the new skills and retire the old ones. Uh, but it, didn't, it doesn't set you up for innovation uh, moving to the new. The next thing we could do, and I, I've definitely done this, so maybe I haven't been a part of using the tools before, but um, I've replaced complete systems, right? So we have the legacy system, and I've come in as an architect or developer, uh, or even delivering or managing the, the delivery of uh, building a new system to completely replace the old system. But this can be costly as well. Like, what are some of the pitfalls that we think that we see here when we have an old system, we're going to build a completely brand new system, replace it? Does anybody have any ideas? What, what can be costly or issues about this? And you can just scream it out. Anything. Requirements. Say again? Missed requirements, right, because the documentation of your old system might not be well documented. People might be gone. You have to reverse engineer sometimes these old systems, right, and you can miss requirements, right, functionality, key aspects of that older solution. Anything else? Resolving old bugs, right, so you have, <laughs> you might, yes, resolving old bugs. Well, hopefully you're building something new so that you're basically putting away this other technology debt, but you're building a big system that could have, you know, your new technology debt. So you might be setting yourself up for a new modernization very well in the next two, you know, couple of years, because. Regressing to old bugs. Sure. Right, lessons learned in the past, is that what you're saying? So you forget those, because those people left. You forget those, right, and then you reintroduce old bugs. Um, it is a, at the end of the day, you have, you know, this big legacy system on this big database, and you end up with a new big, fat Java system on a big, fat Java database, right? Going back to my point, you've just set yourself up probably for a modernization effort uh, earlier. But you can get smart. Like, if you're smart over there, you see you've broken up the Java. You might componentize it and stuff like that. So you're, you're moving down the, the right path, but, but still, right, this is not the, the best thing to do for, one, for a couple other reasons. One, when you're building these systems, it takes a lot of time and money, right? We're not talking a couple of months here or weeks. We're talking years probably to price these larger systems if you're going to go with this approach, which in turn costs a lot of money. And then there's the big bang aspect where you have the, you have the legacy system up and you need to flip over to the new system. And then something that I never quite pay attention to but is just as important is all that data conversion at the bottom, right? That is an, an engagement in and of itself. It's uh, extremely complex and it has to, and it has to go through smoothly. Right? So there's all these aspects of it that make this a, uh, a challenge that I've gone through a couple of times in my career, but still a very large challenge, large, expensive challenge. We could containerize it. Now, what do you get with that, though? <laughs> if, we, if we take our legacy and we containerize it, why do you think we would do something like that? Say again? You guys speak up a little bit. Quick and dirty. It is, well... <laughs> There's some work there. You've got to do a little bit of replatforming, but yes, it is quick and dirty compared to what we just talked about. That's for sure. Yes. You work for IBM. Do I work? <laughs> <laughs> because you work for IBM? Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe that it might be who your employer is, might drive some of that, right? Um, but what it can do is it can get you off of that uh, legacy, the legacy infrastructure, right? So if you're uh, at the end of life, and you need to move off of, right? So there's a reason for that. But again, it's the quick and dirty, so to speak, right? To be able to, to advance that faster, right? To be able to containerize. Uh, but at the end of the day, you still have the old system now in a container. So all that technical debt or the uh, inability to maintain it, um, you did not set yourself up for the new to be able to modernize your, your uh, you know, build new systems, modernize your application. You just have the old now in a container. So there's some benefits there, but and I, I will call out, I, I think on the left, I, I always have, I, I basically am referring to mainframe here, but it's not just mainframe. Our legacy systems aren't just mainframe. It, it very well could be a .NET or Java application that is this big monolith that now is classified as a, we treat it as a legacy system, right? That takes us six plus months or whatever to be able to modify or enhance. We can't, we can't do it in an agile fashion. Now another... We talk about microservices, so I, I assume everyone has heard of microservices, has some idea of <laughs> microservices at this point, right? It's been around for a little while. Uh, we all talk, thought about uh, or known about like service-oriented architecture. But now what's unique about microservices, and I have it in the picture, is the database, right? So we have a slice of data that it owns, it maintains. There's a domain here that it's responsible for uh, that you have your APIs for interactions with, right? So there's an the aspect of the database that is unique in the microservice definition. And so you can build out your microservices 
uh, to be able to uh, build out this new functionality in the cloud. And uh, that, that sounds all great, but now we have a problem here. Now I'll flip one more side because when we have, well actually no, I'm going to go back up. We have a problem here now that we have all these microservices that own their own database and then it's replicating or building on functionality that you know, exists in our legacy. It's around the data. We now have data that's in, in multiple, you know, multiple applications, if you will. Right? So you might have your pieces of now, maybe your user data is now in a microservice, but it's also in your legacy. And if you have other aspects that you need to build, other, other capabilities you need to build, you might have to go to both to be able to get that full picture because you've just split that up. So that becomes a problem. And that's be, there's an answer to that, and that's where we get into digital decoupling, which I'm not going to next, go to after this. But when we build our microservices, usually it also involves we're going to wrap some of our legacy with some APIs that we're going to call. Um, if you've gone through this, right? I've, definitely there's been, there's been times when I've had to, building out the new capabilities, going back and hitting legacy services. Then you get in kind of this multi-speed delivery because sometimes these APIs exist that you need, and sometimes they don't. And when they don't, Typically, when we call it legacy, we're also referring to as slow. Uh, so there's a slower delivery uh, timeline there. So if there's something that's needed, they'll get to it in the next month, six months, year. Depends what their schedule is, right, before you would be able to use that. Now, what's shown on, on, on here, though, is just uh, it, at the title, it says just replace pieces of it. Um, there's a pattern. Does anybody know the name of this pattern? Strangler pattern. I think I heard strangler pattern. Strangler pattern. And that's what it is. So the idea here is as we are building out our microservices, we can, we can start slicing off the uh, legacy uh, capabilities. We can start turning it off. Now, this works great if you actually built your legacy in a modular fashion to begin with. And if you did that, we probably wouldn't be talking about this. <laughs> All right? So we, you've already built it in a modular fashion that can be hands piece at a time. So, but the idea is the strangler pattern is that as we build these out, we'd be able to slice them off. And maybe there's cases where we can do that or not in our legacy. But this is more of a, uh, to me, it's a, it's, a, it's a good, you know, it's a good concept, uh, but hard to, hard to implement in the real world. So we have all these problems with these different, now by the way, I say problems, but these are all valid approaches, right? It depends what your needs are. You can go down the road to, maybe you just need to, to translate the code, right, to get off that legacy. Maybe containerization is the answer for, uh, to drive the business value that you need. So these are all valid approaches. But I want to talk about digital decoupling uh, because I think it meets kind of the demand that we have today. And that's changed the business while, the business while running the business. And the idea is that we talk about legacy as if it's something old and bad, but it's not something that's, well, it might be old, but not bad, right? It's the lifeblood of our companies. It's the lifeblood of our clients, right? It's the one that's making the money that's, that's <laughs> creating the money so that you can actually do the new, right? And so these back-end systems, um, what I've learned over the years, I guess maybe I was a little naive in, in my younger years when I talked about building in the new, building modern systems. My, in my mind, that always meant replacing the old. Well, over time, I've learned that the old isn't going away. Not anytime soon. Mainframes are still around. I thought they'd be extinct by now. That's, that's not the case, and it won't be in the near future either. And so these old systems, they are still viable. They're doing their job. In many cases, there is no need to actually replace them for the tasks they're doing. But what we want to do is build modern applications that have new capabilities, can, inter can inter uh, interact with our customers and clients in new channels, right, uh, that uh, we can't, that we need to integrate with or we need to leverage the old. And so how do we do that? Is we need to be able to get access to that trapped data. We need to get access to that trapped functionality without disrupting those old systems. So we have our microservices that we're building out, but that data was a problem. And there's just a, I know this diagram is really simple, and we're gonna actually go to a kind of a, a pattern or architecture diagram to help illustrate that where we can also poke holes at and ask questions. Like, but the idea is that now we have these event streaming hubs, these data streaming hubs. Kafka is the one doing there. There's, there's other options as well. Uh, but Kafka being, I think, one of the ones that most people are familiar with, you can be able to stream the changes in data that you have and make them near real time, near real time, uh, to the other systems, right? And you can be able to keep things in sync. So now maybe we can call some APIs on the, uh, on the legacy systems, but instead of having to be tied to those legacy systems to be able to get access to their functionality or data, we can, in this case, pull their data over as we need, right? So we're kind of decentralizing this data. Those legacy systems can still be the owner of it, in many cases, but now we're getting a new system where we can build this new functionality. So we're not disrupting the old, or at least not as dangerously as we probably were with some of the other, other methods, but we're able to build these new capabilities out. 
And we'll get to, uh, like I said, we'll get to kind of a simple, arch it's a simple architecture diagram to be able to kind of point out the key points about what this digital decoupling is. And I uh, definitely want to have some interaction if there's any questions or whatnot about it that we can you know, help shine the light on, on uh, what we've done. And at Accenture, I think we've had, since we've introduced digital decoupling or branded it as digital decoupling, again, these aren't, the technologies and everything here isn't anything that we came up with, right? It's about some of the messaging, choreographing it together about like this is what we can do now to be able to answer some of these demands or questions that our, our clients have. Uh, but over, the, over this last year, I think we have about 10 or 30 projects now that we, we call digital coupling that we're doing. We're expecting that to increase because we see a lot of interest in a lot of our clients when we talk about this, even though some of them might have been heading down a similar path or whatnot, but we start to really paint the picture about what it could do for them and have, have examples of that. Cool, so let's talk uh, four, four kind of things that are fundamental to de digital decoupling. So the first one, isolate your legacy system. So we, talk, we talked about that, right? Building your APIs. Um, sometimes we call it wrapping the monolith, right? So we wrap around some APIs. Uh, start to use a strangler pattern. Unlocking the data. I think this is probably the one that, that we miss most often, right? Data is kind of key. Data is very important to microservices, right? Microservices, one of the key things is they must own their own data. Using Kafka and these, these high-speed event hubs, um, we're able to unlock that data. We're able to move it around back and forth. Um, number three, deliver new business value. So this is probably one that, that we see uh, is a big problem with a, lot of, with a lot of the customers, right? You go down this path where maybe you're trying to replace the entire system. You may spend a year working on it, right? And you've delivered zero value to your business. So now they've spent millions of dollars and have gotten nothing back for it, right? With a digital decoupling pattern, we're allowed to make sort of that agile move, deliver short incremental um, improvements along it, along the way, right? And at some point, you know, we, we have a couple customers that have never turned off legacy, right? That may always be running, um, but this allows you to, to deliver that business value in, in an agile way. Um, and, and then the last one, hollow out and replace. So this is, what is the, sh what is the plan for hollowing out that, that mainframe, right? Or that legacy system, start to strip out the the uh, important things that are in there, um, but some of them may be left there. So next, so this is the uh, the simple diagram. I guess it's not that simple. Now that I it's simpler but, than the other ones. We had, so. <laughs> so, there you go. So so we'll talk through uh, a few patterns here. We have a, a whole bunch of patterns that are, that are bounded in here, and I'll, I'll try and run through them all and, and talk through them. Um, so first, we're going to start in the middle there at, at the domain microservices. So we're building microservices, right? I think, I think hopefully everyone is, is familiar with those. Um, REST endpoints, right? It has its own data. It's talking in and, in and out of the event hub, listening for events, consuming it. Uh, if you go just to the right there, you have your specialized views. Um, so what we're talking about there is, are people familiar with CQRS patterns? Yes. So you put those two together. And now you have CQRS, right? So you have your, your microservices that are, are responsible for your commands and updates. You're doing your reads out of your other specialized views so, so you can begin to offload some of that work from there. Um, we'll jump to the left now, the transformer. This one, is, people argue about whether or not it should be in there. Um, I haven't seen this done before without a transformer layer, right? So rarely will your legacy system be talking in events that, that your microservices want to consume, right? There's often other data that they need to pull in, or they need to wait for three or four things to happen in your legacy system, bundle those together, and then publish the event. Um, that's the goal of the transformer. So it can mean many things. Um, it, it can be a whole bunch of different patterns. But essentially, that's how do we get the legacy system talking in events that, that the microservices are ready to consume. Um, again, further to the left there, you can see how we started to wrap the monolith, right? So, so we're showing it here in, in green, right? We, we are wrapping it around with event consumers, CDC. So CDC's been around for a long time. There's lots of great tools. Some people build their own, which is always questionable to me. But um, you know, you're talking about database replication and change data capture. So that's all, all fairly standard. Um, and then the other thing this allows us to do, we have the event hub at the bottom. Um, it, it allows us to get those events out into a data lake, right? I think a lot of people are interested in how do I do AI, machine learning, all those types of things. Right, we can now stream all those events out to our data lake, um, put on BI, you know, reporting, whatever we need to do on top of that, um, and really start to expose that data that was always trapped in the monolith before. Um, any questions on this? Has anybody done anything similar to this? Yeah. 
Now, were there, were there trials and tribulations for those that raised their hand? <laughs> what were some of the pitfalls that you had in here? If you just want to holler something out. No? No? Many. None? Your concurrency. So what do you mean by, what do you mean you cannot have your concurrency? And I, I'm looking out here, I didn't see actually who said. Okay. Ah, all right. Yeah, so we actually, we are working on this pattern right now, mm -hmm. working on it. But uh, we found a problem with this pattern is that if I have two systems, and if one system cannot, uh, so if, if a concurrency happens, I can compensate. But if one system cannot compensate, it's a point of no return, I cannot handle it. So you have multiple legacy systems you're trying to essentially stitch together with this? Is that? I have a multiple microservices which I have built up domain microservices. Mm -hmm. Now two microservices are working on it. The same, same event has to be received by both two microservices, and one is dependent on another. Yeah, so that's typically what we use the transformer for, right? If if it if that problem's coming up, right, we would have that transformer stuck in the single event. So if you're coupling your, yeah, so, uh, maybe this is something we even talk about on the side. So if you're coupling like your microservice logic with your legacy system, so in other words, there's, it's basically your functionality is an extension of that, right? So you're, you're saying that data can travel in. Let's say data travels into the legacy system, right? I capture that data, that change. I put it on the hub, and then it's consumed by the microservice, right, through the consumer here. And then it can process on that. And you're saying that, if it misses that step or misses that beat, if there's something that falls over at that point? You can, I, I think you may have some answers later. We, we can talk later. Okay. Sure. Let's go through it. Well, some other, some issues that, oh, was there another? Yes. Will they use insights? Okay, so will they use the, the lake for the reference data? So, well, you have options to where you would store your, your reference data. So that reference data could be in an in a in-memory database or a service that you can, you know, you can connect to. Could it be in the insights? I guess it's what purpose you want to use your data lake for. So if that's used, if you have certain microservices that need that data to be able, from an AI standpoint, right, can then plug into the, to be able to relearn, right, through the machine learning or whatnot, to, to retrain or whatnot, it could. But like for reference, for master data, well, each of the services itself could be a, a set of master data, right? So you could have your services, if they needed access to that, would, uh, could, con could either call an API uh, to that service, right, to be able to get access to refer reference data. It's like a RESTful API, instead not using the event-based right. architect, right, the event hub. Or if it needs that, if it's something, uh, uh, data that's needed, it could actually be published by the microservice that has that reference data onto the hub and then consumed by the others. And so that actually I have an example of that at uh, one of my current clients that is, is doing just that. They're coming up with their master data model, as they, as they uh, call it. And um, there's some arguments about which, you know, if, that's, if they're using that term correctly or not amongst the, you know, the data architects like to, like to argue. But the point is, they really just want to centralize their data. They have a legacy system, which is a, a .NET system, actually, and it takes a lot to, um, to a lot of time to make changes to it, to offer APIs, to be able to enable new functionality. Um, they're also concerned with newer functionality actually hitting their APIs and driving load against their legacy system uh, that could cause performance problems. Right? They weren't they weren't planning for that load. 
all of a sudden there's a new channel that opened up, right? Millions of hits, whatever, right? But it hits the system and they weren't planning for that. And so they moved to what they were calling the MDM model where they were wanting to take this, a very similar approach. They weren't using a hub. They actually had batch in there that was, they didn't have a change data capture tool or at least not right now. And they're using batch uh, to be able to figure out what to be able to pull from that. And then it puts it on a file through TIPCO and other things and finally gets to the micro, you know, basically where it needs to go. Um, so they're, they're basically, they're, it's similar to this model. They're just not using Event Hub to be able to transfer that data. Um, but in this case, they are building those microservices up around, basically APIs around their MDM, Michael. That's a, and so, and then this will be available to other systems. So they're treating it as, well, when their other systems need this data, it's not going to go to the legacy because they don't want to overwhelm the legacy. Instead, it's going to go to their MDMs, right, for them to be able to access that. Anything else, any other comments? I mean, this, this picture, I said it was simple. It is simple compared to uh, the, uh, the other kind of architecture diagrams you could draw, and, it's, and it kind of makes it seem a little more simplistic than it is. There's, there is a lot of uh, uh, kind of catches here that you need to be, oh, that's embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> thought I put my phone on, on mute, guess not. So, um, I mean, so it, this oversimplifies it, but it points out kind of the key message that we want to call here, the fact that we have a hub uh, there have your domain microservices. There's the concept of the transformer, uh, right? To be able, because your legacy is not talking in a language that your microservices understand. And you need to be able to sometimes stitch multiple events together to be able to be consumed by those. And then there's the concept of CQRS, right? Where we introduce the specialized views to have that read-only path um, and the data that's structured in a way that's useful for that engagement layer, right? Optimal for that engagement layer in your data lakes. And then once you have this in place and from an event-based architecture, you have this information sitting on the hub where you can append other services on top of that, right? For other types of functionality, you might come up with some kind of fraud detection. I know that's, the, you know, when we think about the financial industry or whatnot, they, that's a kind of a key theme around fraud detection. If that data is here, you could have another, you know, similar to, well, it'd be like data lake or insights, but you could have another stream there just focusing on fraud detection pulling in the data, doing real-time analytics against that to see if there's fraud to be able to, to alert. One of, the, one of the other key benefits we saw with this, um, I think it was a, a transportation company, um, they reduced their, their call to their, their MIPS, right, running on the mainframe, right? So they saw significant reduction in cost, and that's how actually how they funded this entire program is through, through that cost save by offloading work off the mainframe. Yeah. Cool. Yes. It can be the source of truth. In this way, we have it written, shown up here. It's, it's not necessarily the source of truth. We have databases in place, right, and it's being consumed. And those databases, your, your legacy can still be the source of truth. For the individual microservices, those databases can be the source of truth. Um, but you can operate, you can work in a database less fashion or where Kafka could be the source of truth, right, where you're, you're sourcing there your, your data, right, and you're querying against that data uh, to be able to that. So it can be the source of truth. There's, in an uh, insurance uh, uh, company, uh, one of my, our other colleagues is working on, in this sense, is they construct a quote, and Kafka is the source of truth in that. The quote basically lives on Kafka, and it gets it pulled, it gets uh, consumed by other services that then, uh, if, they, if it has enough information, it will, it will process that and maybe put pricing against it or other things on that quote, but then put it back on Kafka, right? So Kafka, in that sense, uh, for that object is the is the source of truth, so you can have that model. What is the event hub technology? Uh, in this case, Kafka. Now you have other other options. I know that um, you know you can swipe your credit card on AWS, right, and leverage Kinesis, and then I, I, uh, Azure has their event hub as well. So there are other options out there, but Kafka has become kind of almost a household name, I think, when it comes to event hubs. What was used here? Yeah. Uh, so it, it just depends what the, the uh, tooling could be. So uh, there's, there are tools that are available for like DB2 or Oracle-based systems, right, that can basically read that, tra that uh, transaction log, right, and be able to then take those, those 
changes, right? Each line in that log is a change, right? And then be able to send that change somewhere else in, uh, in, other, in this case, put it on Event Hub. Um, the example I gave earlier, though, it could be, uh, I'll call it a poor man's solution, then it's where there's a batch job. So what they had was a, a, um, a table, really just a, change, a CDC table, if you will, that they put in the database that through triggers would, would basically say that, hey, this particular record, or this ID of the record, uh, was updated, and then the batch job was running. It wasn't real time. In this case, it was just um, it was every 15 minutes would run. But what it would do is to see that change, and then it would gather all the data that it need to to be able to construct the information that was relevant to the microservices down below, right? And the, in this case, that batch job uh, acted as a transformer as well. All right. I think we. I think that was the one minute. We'll one more. One minute. One more question. Why don't we talk offline about that? All right. It's longer than a minute to answer. Longer than a minute. Uh, with our last minute, let's just, if we want to recap and. Yeah, so just re real quick, right? The building blocks we talked about. So CDC is an important part. Event driven of architecture, right? Event streaming, right? Whether it be Kafka or something like that, some sort of event hub. Um, and then microservices, right? Microservices allowing you to unlock that business potential. Um, so really, it, it, it's a combination of these three and, and some well-known architecture patterns. So it is not necessarily, like Dustin said, new technologies or anything like that, right? It's, it's uh, well-known technologies just put together in a, in a unique way. Cool. And then how do we get started? So the first one up here, domain-driven design, has nothing to do with architecture or technology. If people don't know what domain-driven design is, it's the easiest way to figure out how your data should be broken up. Uh, highly recommend it. There's a lot of good design thinking activities around how do you, how do you sort of define a bounded context around what microservices. Um, build a proof of architecture. This is not a proof of concept. I can tell you this concept works. We've done it before, right? To your point, build a proof of architecture, right? We need to test out performance, concurrency, you know, failover, rollback, all these types of things. So, Build the architecture, make sure it actually works, right, for your load. Simulate production loads on it, make sure it's actually going to work before we spend uh, a lot of time and money investing in it and building in it. Um, keep it simple. So again, right, it, it was three pretty simple blocks up there. Don't, don't over-engineer this thing. We're all engineers. We love to come up with complex solutions. The simpler the solution can be here, the, the better it's going to work for you. Um, and, and then the last one, and this is really the, the, probably the hardest one and the one people struggle with the most, is, is be mindful of where the data is, right? You now have multiple copies of that data, right? You may have three or four copies. It may need to go from legacy to new. It may need to go from new eventually back to legacy if you start to switch the, the way the flow goes. Um, so keeping track of where that data is, who's the owner of the data, who's the master of the data, uh, is also a really important piece there. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all.